and his garment became dazzling white. And this is a pattern that Luke discovered early in his writings about Jesus' life. The most significant things happened generally while Jesus prayed. And I think that points something to us. And that's how significant and necessary it is for us to pray. There is an assurance, there is direction that only prayer can bring to us in our lives. Jesus was not only assured through prayer that he had chosen the right way, but more important than that, he now saw the place that Jerusalem held for him and that the cross was going to play in his life. Prayer, folks, prayer helps us to gain an understanding about the meaning of things that sometimes we don't get. A lot of times, I don't get it. Things that are seemingly random and seemingly meaningless. But through prayer, God can line it up and show it to us. But first of all, we've got to pray. And secondly, we've got to listen. So, if God can take these things that we think are meaningless and random, what kind of things are they just for everyday people like us? What do we wrestle with in our humdrum lives? Well, be honest. It could be the loss of a job. It could be the decision, do I get married or not? That brings the second decision. Who do I marry? Which one, A, B, or C? It could be moral factors. It could be financial factors. And then we have to worry about, when we get all of that sorted out, what action do we do to follow up now that we've made our minds that way? So, what I'm saying to you this morning, if all of these things are important enough to worry about and lose sleep about and stew about, Aren't they, aren't they important enough to pray about as well? Jesus gained perspective for his life, especially in regard to his suffering and the cross as he prayed. And prayer does that for us. For so many, for so many, prayer is the last resort. And yet, if you think about it, Prayer for all of us should be the first resort. If we could only speak to God in prayer before we talk to everybody else, I wonder how different, I wonder how more meaningful our lives would be. In Luke's account of all of this, Jesus prayed that the disciples slept. They had fallen asleep. With their heads in the clouds, they drifted off into that wonderful unconscious state. Now, most of you all are familiar with and remember the story of Rip Van Winkle. Good old Washington Irving. Yes, I had to think back, and I can't figure out when it was. John Johnson, when did we study Washington Irving? Eighth grade, ninth grade, later? It doesn't make any difference. We all studied Washington Irving at some point and Rip Van Winkle. And we know that one day he fell asleep along the Hudson River in a quiet spot and didn't wake up for 20 years. And as I've gotten older, I think about a 20 year nap. Holy mackerel, wouldn't that be wonderful? I could do it. When he went to sleep, the sign above his favorite ta uh, tavern said, King George III, King of England. When he woke up, the sign said, George Washington, President of the United States. King George was replaced by an American, and now Rip Van Winkle was an American. The tragic part of it, though, is Rip slept through the whole revolution, didn't get to see any of the action. While he snored, all of these fantastic, earth-shaking things took place. That's what happened to the disciples. 
They were oblivious to everything taking place. They didn't see the transformation. And Jesus and Moses and Elijah just did what they were doing. And they missed out on it. Well, the fact is, folks, it's so often that I and we have our heads somewhat up in the clouds, if you will. We get encapsulated in our own little world. And we're preoccupied with our own self-importance and our own niggling problems. And we become prisoners of our world that's really full of trivialities, if you get down to it. Just nothing much there. So today, our heads and our minds a lot of times are in that dream world. And that's because we're Americans. We live the American dream that prosperity is going to solve most of our problems. I grew up, most of us except for Michael back there, youngster, most of us grew up in the 50s and in the 60s. And we were constantly treated to the wonders and the marvels of that time. At school, we were vaccinated against polio. And that was a problem, that was a worry that we never had to contend with again. I remember the day the first TV was delivered to my house. Right down here at 1794 Linden. That first TV that was delivered from my house came from what used to be a restaurant, or it might have been a bar, the Owl, where the Slider Inn is now. And that was my grandfather's watering hole. I couldn't figure out any other way to put it. That was his watering hole, and he won a television down there, and that was the first TV in our house. I remember when my trips to the Weona store ended because they didn't have enough and it was small and we began going to Montese's. It was huge. It had a selection of enough vegetables to feed Coxie's army. The 50s and 60s were just incredibly good. There was this endless array of gadgets and machines and there wasn't any problem that arose in those days that escaped a solution that was always there. Good times and American technology seemed to go hand in hand. And we were convinced of two things. Two things. One, we were convinced that prosperity was invincible. Once you got prosperous, you were ready to go. Nothing could get you. The second thing was the great society was inevitable. It was going to happen. And it was on these two pillars that we rested our national identity and our hopes for the futures, for the future. In those days, in the 50s and in the 60s, optimism reigned. reigned. Our churches, Central Christian Church, this sanctuary right here in the 50s and 60s were full. All churches were very much full. And we equated our middle class values with the Christian life. Now I found a guy who writes for Newsweek magazine. I don't know whether he still does, but he did two or three years ago. His name is Robert Samuelson. And he pointed out that every age, every era, had its illusions. And ours has been this deep, fervent belief in the power of prosperity. But he reminds us that in our time today, our pillars are crashing around us. Very, very painfully, we are discovering that prosperity is not going to solve all of our personal problems. Prosperity is not going to solve all of our social problems. Samuelson goes ahead and he says that our good society, and this is today, what is today? The 11th of February, 
2024, this article's four or five years old, listen to what he says, equate it to where we are today. He says, our good society has been disfigured by poverty, homelessness, racial tensions, the breakdown of the family, uncontrollable crime, staggering budget deficits, and joblessness. That pretty well covers the waterfront, or at least gets you thinking where we're going. And the result, the result is a deep crisis in our spirit, and not just our spirit, the communal spirit of our country. And it brings on cynicism and confusion as we watch that American dream of the greatest generation unraveling. Samuelson's convinced that we're learning the hard way that prosperity does not automatically bring personal happiness and it does not automatically bring social justice. And I kind of think, as I read this and chewed on it, I kind of think that such a dream might be a, have come a nightmare. Luke says this, and when the disciples awoke, they saw his glory. And they came back to the world of reality. They were awake. They were conscious. And they had come up the mountain with heavy hearts, burdened down with Jesus' words about death and a cross. And they had questions that were still unanswered. Jesus had been talking to them about suffering and about rejection and about death. And they weren't sure what direction they were going to take, let alone what direction Jesus was going to take. But then they woke up and they saw the glory of God. But that begs a question of me. What is the glory of God? You know, we talk about it, but what is it? Well, it means now that they were aware of God's splendor. They were aware of His grandeur. They were aware of His magnificence. And things were in a different light for them. Well, folks, when we awaken to God's glory, then maybe our homes, and really there's not a maybe to it, then our relationships, then our lives, they can also be transfigured and be radiant, the disciples would leave the mountaintop with many of their questions unanswered. And they didn't realize it, but the most difficult times of their lives still lay ahead of them. And that pretty much is our story too, because we don't know what lies ahead. We have no earthly idea. They, the, the disciples just didn't know where all of this was going to lead them. Peter, he confessed, though, Lord, it is a good thing for us to be here. And that might be our confession, too, when we step into God's sanctuary. Lord, it is a good thing for us to be here because it's here on Sunday morning in this church and churches all over creation in this time of worship that we sense we sense the glory of God. The disciples didn't know where they were going, had no earthly idea, but now they knew who was going with them. I preach a whole lot about God is with us. And you get maybe tired of it, and if you do, tell me. And I'll put it another way, but the gist of it is going to be the same thing because I think that is the crux of our faith. She played a minute ago a song I think that I wasn't planning on using because I didn't know she was going to play with it. Play it. But I think it's fitting to close with the words. I'm not going to sing because I don't sing anymore. But he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Going back to Gypsy, a long time ago, Ethel Merman, she sang a song, Wherever we go, whatever we do, 
We're going to go through it together. The good news is the disciples years ago discovered that at the Mount of Transformation.